I'm going to speak to you as a physician. I also wear a hat as a citizen, but predominantly I'll speak as a physician. And I'd like to tell everybody, and I think I speak for all of the panelists, that we don't take care of Republicans. We don't take care of Democrats or conservatives or liberals or progressives or independents. We take care of patients. The context of our care every day, based on the Hippocratic Oath, which was sworn to many, many years ago, with all the experience and the knowledge and the judgment that we've attained through many, many years of practice, is devoted toward the goal of the Hippocratic Oath, which is the best outcome for the patient that we take care of. That is our, our life's mission. So we're not speaking as partisans. We're not speaking with a political agenda. We're speaking as physicians. So let me begin with what the situation was in terms of health care in 2008, 2009 and define for you what I mean by reform. If you talk about health care reform, what are you talking about? If you talk about the quality of health care that's delivered to the American patient, the American citizen, through the last five or six or eight decades, it's unquestionably the best in the world. We don't have a problem with reforming health care quality. That is reformed every day with advancing science and technology and, and therapies and diagnostics. Uh, it's done in the journals, in the medical schools, it's done in the training programs, it's done by all of us as we maintain our knowledge base and we learn from our experience and so forth. It's the best in the world. We don't need to reform it. What we certainly need to do is not degrade it. Okay. So what needs to be reformed? What needed to be reformed in 2009? And what needed to be reformed for the last five decades? The financing and insurance of medical care, the actual spending and, 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 and uh, uh, affordability of medical care. So having said that, the situation in 2009 was, was, was not acceptable to almost all physicians and certainly most patients. The government's tentacles had come into the healthcare system through the Medicare and the Medicaid process decades ago. And some of the laws and the regulatory features of the, of the government uh, has really strangled health care as it's advanced. And it's advanced with great quality despite those obstacles. In addition, the insurance industry has come between the doctor and the patient in many, many adverse ways. Obviously, they do good in, ter in terms of an affordable mechanism for health care delivery, but the, the perverse effects of health insurance have become unbelievably severe and require reform. The uh, EMTALA law, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act in 1986, signed by a Republican president, uh, literally dumped the responsibility of taking care of uninsured patients on physicians and hospitals without any reimbursement. Unlike food stamps where the grocery store gets paid, housing units where the landlord gets paid for government housing, medicine just cost shifted all that to insured patients. It was very unfair and it, it really made the entire system uh, unmanageable o over time. Uh, and there's many other examples. The HMO money, that, the seed money, which was planted during the Nixon uh, administration. All these things between government and large insurance be made, ma made medicine very, very difficult to practice in and to administer. And so we needed reform. We absolutely needed reform. We had an election in 2008, and in early 2009, I had the fortune of meeting Hugh Hewitt, one-to-one, -one a very personal conversation with him for 20 minutes. And he said to me, quote unquote, Doctor, your profession in the American healthcare system will be degraded and transformed into a government control system. You must prepare for the fight of your life as a physician and as a citizen. There is a tsunami about to engulf you. I was 60 years old. I've been practicing for 31 years. Uh, truly loving the profession I'm in and, and doing the Lord's work. I mean, it's, it's, it's an unbelievably wonderful thing to be a doctor and to, to be a doctor in the modern era. And so I took the challenge. I took him up on it. And uh, I do know about government health control. Dr. Vliet's going to expand on that. But the, uh, the difference in outcome and longevity in countries that have government-controlled health care and government, governments that have a system like ours is, is remarkable. And I won't belabor that, the longevity, the outcome. Uh, why is that? Do the government control systems have different textbooks, different knowledge? Do they have different machines? Do they have different drugs? No, they have government 
control. That's the problem, and, and uh, that will be expanded on later. After Hugh Hewitt took me by the ears and kind of shook me like a nine-year-old, I, I got in touch with uh, Hal Schertz in Atlanta, uh, and I, I, he recruited me to form the chapter, the Arizona chapter of Docs for Patient Care, an advocacy group that is dedicated to protecting the sanctity of the doctor-patient relationship, the way you and I work together to make decisions and to do therapies and to prolong your life and to cure your illnesses and to palliate your illnesses when cure is impossible. The, the website, docs4patientcare.org, is down there. I, I recommend to everyone to look at that website. The amount of information is so abundant. There's 200 legislators in the United States House of Representatives and Senate that use our website to, uh, to inform themselves about the health care issues that are on the plate this year and the last year. And I might add that all of the doctors in Congress, and there are quite a few of them, are members of Docs for Patient Care. We are the organization that represents practicing doctors. This is the, the leaders of Docs for Patient Care last November in Washington. We go to Washington every couple of months. We meet with all of the uh, leaders in Congress that are potentially uh, allies in the repeal effort. Uh, there's over 150 of them that we, we talk to, and all of the physicians in Congress, led by Tom Price, uh, conference with us once a month by phone. So we have a strategic relationship with those in Congress, and we will be there to help write the legislation for real health care reform if and when the Supremes throw that law out or we repeal it next year in the next Congress. There's also a, a parallel organization called the Doc Squads, which uh, Sue mentioned. This is a group of doctors around the country. We're moving toward a thousand doctors who are active in every legislative area that will be helping to, to achieve a repeal-capable Congress next year. So let me proceed with the issues of health care, understanding health care reform. You know, in, in 2009, there was a, a little, literally a fire ignited in the country when the Senate began to move toward a health care reform model called PPACA. And as you know, with town halls and with activism all over the country, the country was loud and clear that this, this was a law in its entirety that was, a, that was not good for America. Uh, according to the majority of Americans. And lo and behold, with the supermajority in the Senate and the House, 60, 60 votes in the Senate, they passed, the Senate passed the law on Christmas Eve in a snowstorm because they couldn't send the senators back to their states because if they did, they, they would have been pummeled in, in, in their districts and, and, and their, and their uh, states with, with the anger by citizens. So they passed it on Christmas Eve. It went over to the House after January, and the House was going to work on it, change the language, take out some of the abortion language, and lo and behold, Scott Brown gets elected in January. Well, now we don't have a 60-member House majority, a Senate majority, and so the law cannot be, the bill cannot be changed in the House, because if it goes back to the Senate with one word of change, then it has to go through the cloture process, 60 votes are required to get it to the floor, and it would never have happened. So Bart Stupak and his pro-life uh, representatives came down and said we can't vote for this law, uh, for this bill, and the president wrote out an executive promise that there would be no abortion pills or abortion uh, 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 monies spent uh, in that direction. Look what happened in January with HHS and the Catholic Church, but nevertheless they bought it and went back to the Senate, signed, and on March 23rd we had Pete Packer. So it was a process that was done with bribes and all kinds of deals, the Cornhusker kickback, the Louisiana Purchase, a thousand others, whole states being, being given uh, waivers uh, like Nevada and so forth. So it, it didn't look good to the American people, it didn't feel good, it wasn't right. Remember, Medicare took 13 years to legislate through the Eisenhower, the Johnson, and the, uh, uh, the Kennedy and the Johnson administration, seven Congresses, and bipartisan support for the law in 1965. It was a good law then. It's morphed into something else, a different issue but it was a good, good piece of legislation, 1965. This was done in one year without one vote of the opposing party and against the will of the American people. So that's, that's where we stand and that's where we started to move quickly to try to deal with this. 
And I, I just want to parenthetically put in the issue of the American Medical Association. I'm not a member of the AMA. I haven't been since 1992. But the AMA in 2010 had one out of six doctors in America as members. They don't represent the practicing physicians in America. They give membership to, to their interns and medical students and the residents and the fellows in the country, about 40,000 of them for free. So the actual representation of practicing doctors and with all the losses of doctors that have left uh, since then, it represents about 9% today. So this is, the, this is the organization that was put in front of the American people by those pushing this law that this represents American medicine's opinion. Not true at all. Not true. It was, it was deceptive. And as a result, the legislators today that we're close to and we, we talk to and we, we visit in Washington and it will help us with the repeal and the reform effort that's going to follow, uh, tell us today, had the AMA said, no, 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 this is not reform. This is government control. We want real reform. We want financing and insurance reform. PPAC would never have passed. Democratic senators and representatives have told us the same thing. Okay, so what is the law? This is a 2,700-page law, and there's 1,800 references to the Secretary of Health and Human Services in this law. The Secretary shall, or shall promulgate, or shall decide, or will do, or... And so this law is going to be written for the next 100 years. This is just the template for about 200,000 pages of regulation. Okay? And it's going to control every single thing about healthcare in America. It's moving toward that very quickly. Without repeal, without the Supreme Court dealing with it in, 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 a, in a good way, uh, we are going to see January 1st, 2014, this law becomes cemented into place. And it forever will change the healthcare uh, landscape of America. There will never be any reform after that, which we desperately need, and it's going to move very quickly, and it's going to be very damaging to this nation. Okay, now this, this is the law. Now, I, I don't think I'm going to go through any of this, but I want to show you, if this is the insurance industry in years past, and here's me, the doctor, and here are you folks, you're the patient. The insurance company has been kind of an obstacle between the two of us. Okay, it's, it's interfered with our relationship, our decision making, our choices, in a, lot of, in a lot of ways our healthcare freedom. This is the government. This was two years ago. This thing is 10 times as big now. And I'm still over here and you're still over here. And the distance between us is getting much greater. And we haven't seen anything yet until 2014. It's a pretty, pretty difficult situation in the future if this is not dealt with. I think most Americans were left with the feeling that we, we were kind of taken. And then we told them, you can keep your doctor. This is kind of a partisan slide. I don't want to be partisan, but that's how Americans felt. And, and we, uh, we felt kind of uh, cheated in terms of an honest approach to the health care reform that this nation really needs, which is insurance and financing. Well, what about the economics? And I'll be brief here. I have some good news and I have some bad news. And the bad news is really bad. Now here's the good news. In July, the United States of America will only be $16 trillion in debt. That's the good news. Actually, it's, it's just the least of the bad news, okay? But that's, that's the news that we all think about. But what's gonna happen economically with, with this law? Well, if you go back to 2009 and look at the way the Congressional Budget Office, a nonpartisan component of the analytic ways of looking at laws and figuring out what they're going to cost, uh, they got from Congress a template of PPACA that was six years of expenses starting in 2014 and 10 years of revenue, which weren't going to start in 2010, but it was factored in. So we had, we had revenue of 10 years and we had expenses of six years. Then we had a projection of $575 billion out of Medicare, which was kind of counted as Medicare revenue because it wasn't being spent, but then it was all being allocated to other areas to pay for Obamacare. So it was double counted, it was very duplicitous. And so when it was all added up, that and the taxes, we had this $980 billion cost, and we had about one trillion or so, or slightly more, of, of revenue with this equation. 
So we had a, a net surplus. So now the promise of this reform bill, will, this law, will save America money. Okay, well, the CLASS Act, you might know what that is. It's community living assistance, uh, securities, uh, I forget the last S, Act. And it's basically a long-term care act. And what Congress did was they put that into the law with the idea that Americans would pay premiums of about $380 a month for a long, long time. And then when you got sick and you needed living assistance like long-term care does, you'd get $50 a day. Okay, that was the revenue calculator to help figure out the savings with the health care law. That law has since been suspended. And it's, there's a repeal vote coming in the House of Representatives. Bonnie Frank is going to vote for that law, for that repeal. So that, that was a, a sleight of hand. And, and one of the uh, senators who passed this law in 2010 said, this was a Ponzi scheme that Bernie Madoff would have been proud of. Okay, this was how the law was calculated in terms of expense and revenue and how much it would save America. Well, the current numbers now revised a bit show that the 10-year estimate is now, it's going to cost 1.7 trillion. And that's considered to be a gross underestimation. And there are economists out there who are now saying, ultimately in the full expression of this law by 2017, 2018, gonna cost America a trillion dollars a year. Remember, we collect about two and a half trillion dollars of taxes a year in America to run the government. Our baseline without a, a budget for the last three years has risen to 3.7, 3.8. Another trillion dollars a year on top of that makes it virtually undoable. It's an equation for economic doom in this country. Okay, between the debt and between the cost of this law, expanding government to a unbelievable size to fix certain problems that could be market-based in terms of solution, and certainly devoted at patience, which this is not, uh, is, is, uh, is a very scary thought, and uh, something that every citizen has to think about, even before they begin to think about how is it gonna affect your actual health care, and we'll proceed with that. So I'm going to stop and introduce Dr. Liette, and she will go on with the constitutional issues.